Welcome to the webinar, Challenges in Assessing Dyslexia with Dr. Nancy Mather. The PowerPoint point slides are available for you to view and download on our website, and that link will be posted. Let's go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about WPS. When we develop a new test, we bring an author's idea to life. We answer a researcher's question, meet a clinician's need, and ideally change an individual's life for the better. So I'm now going to introduce our speaker, which uh, is Dr. Nancy Mather. You can go to the next slide, Dr. Mather. She is a professor emerita at the University of Arizona. Dr. Mather's career has focused on assessment and intervention for individuals with dyslexia and learning disabilities, and she has published numerous articles and books and conducts workshops on both assessment and instruction for students with dyslexia. Dr. Mather is also the co-author of several widely used standardized tests, including Tests of Dyslexia, published by WPS. Welcome, Dr. Mather. We're so excited for you to be here today. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, it's so nice to be here with you all today. Before I actually start into our topic of challenges in assessing dyslexia, just want to show you one of the you know really beautiful parts about living in the desert. Um, so these cactus, you know, they bloom and they just you know have the most spectacular uh, you know blooms on them, and so um, it's just always something to really you know look forward to. Um, and so this is an Argentinian giant. And what's interesting about this is it blooms for one day and the next day, that's what it looks like. So it's kind of crazy. Um, uh, I'm not very good at uh, plants, but you know, when your cactus slowly walks away because it knows you're capable of killing it. <laughs> I thought, you know, that that is, that's kind of funny because it, you know, does look like he's uh, running away. So, we're going to talk just about some of the challenges people face when they're um, assessing for uh, dyslexia. So before I start in, just two um, test disclosures. I am the co-author of the Test of Dyslexia. Uh, I'll just briefly describe that at the um, end of our session. I'm also a co-author of Woodcock Johnson 4, and I'm planning to just use that in a few uh, case examples. Now, you, you probably don't have these javelina, you know, where you live, but, uh, you know, they come in and out of your yard, um, and uh, sometimes there's a pack of them, like 15 of them or so. But anyway, what are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk about what are the challenges in assessing students uh, for dyslexia. So these are some of the major challenges we'll go through. Um, use of terminology our learning disability identification procedures, uh, going beyond phonological awareness, twice exceptional students, confounding factors, uh, comorbidity, early identification, um, late or no diagnosis, getting people to implement our recommendations, sometimes having a child who doesn't want to cooperate or is not motivated, uh, malingering, using multiple tests to try to make um, a diagnosis, uh, and then an examiner's understanding um, of the characteristics you know, of dyslexia. So one thing that can be a bit confusing depending on uh, your profession is that we have the word dyslexia, but then we have other terms that can also mean dyslexia. So you may be working in a school where you don't use the term learning um, dyslexia, but you say a learning disability and basic reading skills. Um, or you may be working in a private clinic and you see a specific learning disorder with an impairment in reading. And any of those you know, could refer to dyslexia. So many times what happens is uh, you'll say uh, your son has a learning disability and basic reading skills. Um, and then, you know, the parent will say, uh, does that mean he has dyslexia? Because uh, parents are more familiar with the term uh, dyslexia uh, than a learning disability, you know, and basic reading skills. And so just to kind of avoid this confusion, lots of times it's better to say maybe 
also known as dyslexia or some are referred to as dyslexia, um, just so it's clear to parents and teachers that uh, this case is looking like, you know, a case of dyslexia. So this process, right, we have now of learning disability identification is very confusing, you know, right now. It reminded me a little bit, you know, of this sign. So we have these three procedures to identify learning disabilities. Um, in the United States, you know, as you know, uh, ability achievement discrepancy, uh, response to intervention, and oftentimes what's referred to as the PSW approach or a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. And it's interesting because probably about uh, half of the state's districts are still using ability achievement discrepancy. So, you know, which came first, the reading disability, you know, or the discrepancy? Um, and so one of the things we often see is the di reading disability comes first, uh, but the discrepancy then comes with time uh, when you're not, you know, keeping up. So years ago, Dr. Barbara Bateman said the problems in using a formula to identify students who have learning disabilities are many serious uh, and too often uh, disregarded. So this seems to be a little bit of an example, you know, of a severe discrepancy. But um, some of the problems with ability achievement discrepancy are that students with dyslexia don't spend a lot of time reading. Um, and so their knowledge and vocabulary tests, uh, it doesn't increase like people who, you know, are avid readers. And so then um, when their vocabulary knowledge is measured, it's much lower, uh, reducing the size of the discrepancy. We also know effective intervention reduces the size of the discrepancy. And so when the student gets good help, they might not qualify anymore um, under an ability achievement discrepancy. Um, young children are yet far enough behind, and uh, really does prevent early identification. So uh, it's often be, um, you know, been referred to as a wait to fail model that uh, you have to wait till kids are in second and third grade uh, in order to provide them with services when we know that the most effective thing we can do uh, is get kids in for um, early intervention. And so it can be frustrating, you know, for parents as well, too. Um, this was from the Rose Report, but she says, I gave up on her school. I was literally banging my head on a brick wall. Everyone knew she couldn't read to save her life. That's what was causing all her other problems, especially at home. Um, you know, it was a nightmare. And so, again, we want to make sure our parents, you know, um, don't give up. So response to intervention can monitor the progress of all the students in the school. Um, it can really reduce the number of referrals to special education um, and provide adequate timely interventions to all our students. So how do you determine though then when the response is inadequate? Um, you know, inadequate response to intervention, uh, limited response to intervention, um, when provided with good instruction aimed at their needs, our students with dyslexia, they do respond and they do make good progress. So again, how do we figure out, um, you know, how to identify, you know, lack of response? Uh, here's an example of Jesse. He's 13. He was retained. He's actually in sixth grade at this point. But um, so I wrote in January, he says, the church is the best in the world because we get a piece of bread. I get to play with clay and I get to drink wine and we get a lot of food. So he started get, getting very targeted, good help. Um, and he dictated then this paragraph to him in April and I'm write it again. Now you can just see again how much growth there has been um, in terms of spelling over this three, four uh, month period for Jesse. So our kids with dyslexia, do make good progress when they get the right kind of help. I got this email several years ago um, where she said she heard me speak at a conference. She said, here's my question. I recently was at a CSE meeting, CSE meeting for one of my students. 
The chairperson said Michael wouldn't qualify for an LD classification under RTI because he'd made some academic gains. He was classified speech language impaired last year. When the speech teacher reassessed him, she found he scored out of that classification. I explained Michael had not yet filled the gap, although progress was evident. He was still reading a year and a half below grade level expectations. She said that in order for him, for any child to qualify for an LD classification, RTI requires that the child makes no progress. Can you provide me with any information would clarify what she's saying, whether it's actually a valid interpretation. So RTI requires a child makes no uh, progress. <laughs> you know, it's like, really? Um, anyway, you know, I'm sorry. I don't think RTI has a lot to do with the identification um, of dyslexia. So um, in terms of telling you again, um, you know, why the student is struggling. It doesn't uh, really tell us why they're not responding. Uh, it doesn't classify, individualize, diagnose. And so we really need to understand with the student with dyslexia, why are they having so much trouble, you know, learning to read? So, you know, so one thing that's happened in some districts is they're not doing comprehensive evaluations, um, you know, early on. And, um, uh, just again, instituting an RTI kind of, you know, process. And so I got this Christmas card from a former student who's actually working in a clinic in Chicago. And, you know, she says, uh, you know, so for now, I'm okay. I'm testing more. RTI has sure kept us in business despite the economy. You know, and so again, you see that uh, parents still want comprehensive evaluations. And then when schools don't do them, parents have to go outside of the school. Um, and then we think about really the only people that can afford uh, these types of evaluations or, you know, parents that, um, you know, do have um, enough money to afford this type of evaluation. Anyway, so um, no dogs behind this point. I, I think sometimes we just, you know, have to rebel. Um, I really think we should say RTI stands for the right to intervention, that we want every child in the school who needs help to get, you know, the help they need, um, you know, and deserve. So, you know, another concern, um, you know, is going beyond phonological awareness. Um, we, we've got to move beyond a single deficit model into a multiple deficit model. So this single deficit model suggests difficulties with reading stem primarily from poor phonological awareness. Um, it is what the IDA definition emphasizes. Many state definitions in handbooks say it needs to be a problem uh, in phonological awareness. So the phonological deficit view that's dominated the field for years is inadequate for explaining all cases of reading disorder um, and its importance has been perhaps um, overstated. Uh, so Dr. Bruce Pennington said that if we adhere to a single deficit profile, or well, that's limited utility, but using only poor phonological awareness as a criterion for dyslexia, would result in missing about one half of the cases. And so we need to look at other factors as we've talked about you know, earlier in the last session, uh, things like processing speed and orthographic processing and uh, working memory, um, other um, linguistic risk factors um, in addition to you know, phonological awareness. So twice exceptional students, this can also um, be challenging because many times these students, you know, they'll get reading scores in the average range. And so it looks like they're uh, not having that much difficulty, you know, but here's Aaron, he's in sixth grade. Uh, his story here, he says, mystical creatures. Hi, my name's Fred. I'm the most unique mystical creature in the planet. I can travel through time dimensions. I've got the body of a gargoyle, the wings and tail of a dragon. The dimension I live in is called the land of mystical creatures. One day, me and my wife talked about doing some time traveling. We didn't know where we wanted to travel, so we looked at the maps we had. 
Here is when I heard Julie call out. What is it, I asked. She brought it over and read Planet Earth. I thought about it. I realized we'd never visited this planet. And that's when the trouble began. And so you look at the discrepancy here between this boy's um, ideation um, and his spelling. Uh, it's a good story. He's got a great start on an exciting story. But uh, then you just look at simple words here, like um, not spelling we correctly, W-E-E, -E, spelling some, you know, S-U-M, no, N-O-W, um, here, H-E-R. And so um, you can just see again this discrepancy between spelling um, and his ideas. So our twice exceptional students can have reading scores that are in the average range and they still have dyslexia. You have to think about how bright are they? Um, what's their educational history background? Uh, what kind of opportunities have they had? Um, how do they function you know, on a daily uh, basis? So Dr. Shaywood said, there's no one single test score ensures a diagnosis of dyslexia. It's the overall picture that matters. An extremely bright child who has a reading score in the average range, but who still struggles, cannot learn to read fluently, has uh, dyslexia. So back in 1932, Monroe said that children of superior mental capacity who fail to learn to read are, of course, spectacular examples of specific reading difficulty, since they have such obvious fields and other uh, in other such obvious abilities in other fields. Um, and she talked about the case Betty then. She said, Betty represents a case of reading retardation and a very bright little girl. She's completing the second year in school without having been able to learn to read. When examined, she was seven years, four months of age, mental age of 10 years, IQ 135. Arithmetic measured high second grade. Reading and spelling measured very low first grade. She had a very engaging manner, had learned many ways of diverting attention from the fact she could not read. When the reading tests were presented, she pushed them aside and said, let's don't do any reading. I know some arithmetic games that are lots of fun. When finally persuaded to attempt the test, she showed considerable emotional tension, clearing her voice, saying ah several times before attempting each word and flushing over her obvious errors. And so individuals who are identified as intellectually gifted may also have learning disabilities. Um, and although these individuals may appear to be functioning adequately in the classroom, their performance may be far below what they're capable of given their intellectual ability. Um, and we'll often see that these students are really overlooked until later in their academic careers. Uh, they may not even be identified until they go to um, college or, you know, perhaps, um, you know, high school. So we also have confounding factors. Um, our English language learners, uh, the impact of COVID-19, um, self-esteem, motivation, and well-being of students. Uh, the quality of the home environment. So we know that languages have different uh, different terms of their orthography. So we have languages that have shallow or transparent orthographies, and there's higher regularity between uh, the phonemes and the graphemes. And so this would be Spanish, German, you know, Finnish. Then we have our deep orthographies. There's more complex relationships between the phonemes, graphemes, and also um, you know, morphology, so English and French, a um, little bit, you know, more difficult uh, to learn to read. But what we do see is at the start of literacy instruction, these three variables appear to be good predictors of reading skill in most languages. So phoneme awareness, letter knowledge, and rapid automatized naming. Um, and it seems that in languages with a shallow orthography, RAN is a stronger predictor of reading um, than phoneme awareness, um, particularly as uh, reading skill, you know, develops. You know, so COVID-19, this kept many children out of school for an entire school year. Um, 
The effects on the growth in oral reading fluency, students grades two and three were profound for the 2020 school year. Students in lower achieving school districts developed reading skills at a slower rate than those who were in higher achieving ones. So um, the PALS report, they um, administered to 132 Virginia school divisions. Um, and you know what they found is proportionately higher rates of below benchmark scores among students who are black, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged English learners or have uh, disabilities. Students' literacy development continues to be negatively impacted by disrupted learning opportunities re resulting you know, from the pandemic. So um, the recent you know, NAEP report came out and it's you know, kind of interesting you know, to look at these results too. So the average reading score, both fourth and eighth grade, decreased by three points compared to 2019. Um, and so average scores, again, you know, declined uh, in both fourth and, you know, eighth grade in terms of, you know, the reading scores. But this is something, you know, I found interesting when you look at um, grade four and you look at grade eight. And you see, you know, where we are in terms of fourth grade and where we are in terms of eighth grade. And you look back and you see, you know, we're exactly the same as we were in 1992. Um, so there really has been no um, great progress in terms of, you know, solving this reading crisis and um, getting more of our students, you know, to, um, you know, up to um, grade level. So dyslexia affects self-esteem, motivation, emotional well-being. Maria's in eighth grade. She says, I'm so stressed out with school. I cannot write. I feel like I'm not good at anything and my self-esteem is very low. So Brian, okay. So Brian came to see me. His parents referred him for a reading evaluation. And he, he wasn't happy about, you know, having to do this. And so he comes walking in the door, you know, and, and the first thing he says to me, he said, I, I don't care what we're doing, but I'm not reading for you. I said, well, that's interesting. This is a reading evaluation. It's interesting. Um, anyway, so I said, okay, well, you know, let's start out. Let's just, you know, do some writing. So I had him, uh, you know, write a few little things. And pretty much, pretty soon he picks up his pen and he writes, you know, this is the last thing I'm doing. So um, it, this doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while uh, we get a student, you know, who's not cooperative or not um, feeling very happy about their day. So here's a little note, you know, to Julian. Dear Julian, have a great day. Love, Mom. I will not. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, when you're struggling in reading, school um, is definitely not uh, oftentimes a fun place, you know, uh, to be. So, you know, we also want to think about the home environment um, and it can make such a difference just in terms of, you know, prognosis, um, early intervention. So you look, look at this dad and his baby here. he'll be for kindergarten when he starts and these are two little twin girls uh, they just turned two
you know, and, and so you think again, you know, um, how prepared, you know, these girls will be by the time they enter kindergarten. They're already singing the alphabet song and um, getting familiar with letters. So comorbidity is another challenge. Oftentimes individuals with dyslexia have uh, problems with mathematics, uh, ADHD, uh, language impairments, you know, dysgraphia. So um, some of our students with dyslexia also have difficulties uh, with math. You know, so <laughs> here we have find X. Here it is. <laughs> But um, oftentimes we'll see, you know, with mathematics, problems in working memory, uh, storing and retrieving math facts, slow processing speed, slow rapid number naming, um, and high comorbidity with ADHD. So in terms of ADHD, about 25 to 40% of individuals with ADHD also meet the criteria for reading disability. And 15 to 35% of individuals with a reading disability also meet the criteria uh, for ADHD. And it's very difficult sometimes um, determining, you know, is it ADHD, you know, or is it, you know, reading disability, particularly with young children. I had this mom bring me her six-year-old son and she wanted to know, does he have dyslexia or not? Well, he had the worst attention I think I've ever seen in a six-year-old. Um, you know, he just he kept looking everywhere. Um, I couldn't get him to look down at print. He'd look up immediately. Um, and I had to give him a sticker every time he answered a question. He was pretty much sticker man by the time he left. But um, mom comes to pick him up and she says, well, does he have dyslexia? And I said, I don't have a clue. I said, you know, um, I, he's got problems with attention and... Um, until that's resolved, you really can't tell if it's a reading disability um, yet, you know. Um, and so uh, it's very difficult sometimes with young kids. Is this ADHD or, you know, is it a reading disability? So this is Weston, and he's in third grade. He does um, have some attention issues. Yeah, All right. I want to listen to you read aloud. Read as carefully as you can, not as fast as you can. If you come to a word you cannot read, just do your best and then go on to the next word. Start here and read a story about bees. A story about bees. Bees are little. Bees are bugs. Bees can make whack. Bees have lots of jobs. Okay, go ahead. Here is more about bees. They live in most parts of the world. They have two pairs of wings. They are three kinds of bees. I know this kind of bees. The queen is the only bee that is able to lay eggs. I know those types of bees. Squash bee, honey bee, and I forgot bee. All right, keep going. Watch me just go. Take a much pollen as it can go. And if you're in a field, it most it's most likely to go be and hit you and run into you. Okay, keep going. The largest. In <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So you know, it's kind of funny when you Google pictures of kids with ADHD. This is the kind of stuff that comes up. You know, like wild children <laughs> wild children um, i love this note though from liam uh, dear brody miss p made me write you this note all i want to say sorry for is not being sorry because i tried to feel sorry but i don't <laughs> and so i think this is probably the 32nd diagnosis of adhd um you know he's he stuck his head through a chair i mean you know who does that who does that but it's kind of funny because it seems like lots of times these kids with ADHD get assigned first year teachers. Um, Nico's in fourth grade and the teacher is kind of all day long. Sit still, get back to your seat. Nico, sit down. Nico, pay attention. Um, so one afternoon he wrote this note and he, you know, put it on her desk. 
he says, I want to be able to concentrate. I mean, he wants to be able to concentrate, but, uh, you know, that's what's difficult when you have ADHD is uh, focusing. So, um, you know, reading comprehension. So if there's problems in reading comprehension, but they're not attributable to poor word recognition, these comprehension problems are general to language comprehension rather than specific to reading. And so if the problem is reading comprehension, but there's no problem reading words, um, it typically would not be dyslexia. Uh, it would be a problem in terms of you know, language comprehension. So these findings confirm children with dyslexia or developmental language disorder are at risk for reading comprehension difficulties, but for different reasons. Weak decoding in the case of dyslexia, weak oral language skills in the case of developmental language disorder, and different forms of intervention are required for these groups of children uh, targeted to their areas you know, of weakness. So language is a critical foundation for learning to decode and comprehend Children with language difficulties at school entry are at high risk of reading disorders. Uh, the etiology of reading disorders is multifactorial. Reading disorders are highly comorbid disorders of math, language, attention, um, and you know also um, dysgraphia. So, you know, is it dysgraphia or dyslexia or both? Uh, Dan is in fourth grade, you know, and you look at his writing. Um, and you can just look at his writing, you know, and see he's got dysgraphia. Once I was lost on a dock, I fell in the water. I was scared under a boat. Boat started off, started away, and then I was up the end. But um, you could just see the difficulty. But um, when we look at his spelling and his reading, he's actually um, a pretty good reader. And so... Um, in this case, uh, we'd be more likely to call this dysgraphia uh, and not dyslexia. But, you know, what was interesting about this young man is he was such a good artist. And so it's just kind of mind boggling when you just think, you know, how well he can control the pen when he's drawing uh, versus, you know, for handwriting. So another thing that can be difficult um, is early identification. So Kai is six years old, eight months, he's in first grade. Um, and we look at his Woodcock Johnson reading scores, you know, and if you look, you kind of go like, you know, I mean, doing pretty well, he's doing pretty well. Um, so you might not be too concerned, but then when you just start looking at more information, he reversed about half of his letters. I mean, um, you usually just don't see somebody making, you know, that many uh, reversals. Um, so, you know, reversing, you know, at least, at least half of his letters. Um, and, you know, even when he's doing numbers and things like that, so he's writing a lot of the numbers uh, backwards. So, you know, additional considerations, he had speech language therapy, uh, from three to five. He's been writing his name since he was three. He still writes a backward K. Uh, his father's a heart surgeon. His mother's a psychiatrist. So um, his father had similar symptoms. He flunked handwriting. He said school was torture until he got to college. He was in the gifted program. A teacher told his parents he was an underachiever. Kai's older sister, age 10, is in the gifted program. Kai's in an enriched environment with lots of reading and, you know, lots of books. And so, um, again, he's at very high risk in terms of reading failure. So we would want to make sure that he gets intervention, starts intervention. So, you know, sometimes you have a case where everything is low um, and then it's confusing. Well, <laughs> what is it? What is it? Um, 
So I got this email from Hugh's mother. She says, Hugh struggles with all subjects. He's been getting extra help with reading, writing, and math. I don't see much progress. For reading and math, he might know it one day, not the next. He can't spell. He guesses at words. He doesn't like to sound words out. Seems like he can read backwards better than forwards. He does have a diagnosis of ADD from a pediatrician, but he's not on medication. In first grade, I asked for them to test him. They did February of 2022. They said he didn't qualify help. He was low cognitively. I don't believe that. He's small. I thought it was a developmental delay. I moved him to a charter school. They don't do spelling tests there. When I asked about dyslexia testing recently, they were going to have someone like an aide do the testing, and she'd also do the dyslexia tutoring. I'm worried they don't know, you know what they're doing. So... You know, we look um, at Hugh's scores um, and, you know, with the exception of academic knowledge, science, um, you know, all, everything's low. Um, so, you know, you, we look at, he forgets to put an H on his name, tall, big, you know, cat, um, you look at his spelling, you know, and then even looking at his math, uh, two plus one is seven, one plus three is eight, six plus one is three, three plus three is four. So just even, you know, um, basic, you know, calculation. So these are tough cases, you know, um, you know, what, you know, what is it? What is it? Is it ADHD? Uh, is it dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia? I mean, you know, uh, these are just tough cases when um, you have something like this where, you know, everything is uh, low. So um, late diagnosis. Veronica has dyslexia, you know, but it never has been uh, diagnosed. A little bit about her background. She's 19. She's going to a local community college and she's struggling with the amount of required reading. She'd like to transfer to a four-year college, but fears she's not going to be able to keep up with the reading demands. And one of her teachers suggested, you know, she get an evaluation. And so, you know, when we look back at her history, she went to private schools. She had two years of Wilson language training from a private tutor three times a week from fourth to sixth grade. She received informal accommodations from teachers throughout her school years. Note, she's always been a slow reader and has had trouble finishing tests. And so, you know, again, we can see in her case, um, she does have dyslexia, but her first diagnosis then uh, is going to college, going to college. Um, so sometimes, again, we see with these um, students who aren't diagnosed till they get to high school or college that there has been intense instruction outside of the school. Um, so parents get their child tutoring. They may take them to a summer camp for kids with dyslexia. Uh, oftentimes teachers who are in small private or charter schools uh, provide accommodations to students informally, let them have more time, you know, if they need it. Um, limited understanding of dyslexia. So sometimes again, teachers and parents may believe that the student is capable you know, but they're just not trying hard enough. And, you know, that was like the case with Kai's father, where the parents, you know, the, the teachers really thought he was an underachiever and he just wasn't, you know, trying. But, um, you know, again, uh, that wasn't uh, the case. So Crookshank said back in 1983, a definition is relatively worthless unless it results um, in action. And so, again, we want to make sure that um, assessments lead, you know, to action and that students um, get um, teachers who have adequate training in reading instruction, you know, and know um, how to help them. So every once in a while, um, there's challenges with getting people to implement your recommendations, um, getting people to follow through, carry them out, um, getting testing agencies to approve your recommended accommodations. You know, sometimes I'll see reports and there's like 20 pages of recommendations. And 
I feel so overwhelmed looking at it. I think we're much better off if we just target like what needs to happen now. Um, come to me again when you need more ideas. But it's just sometimes it's just too many to sort through. You don't know where uh, to start. But so I saw this boy, Justin, when he was in third grade. Um, and he'd been first tested when he was in first grade and the school psychologist had written, he requires a systematic explicit phonics approach to learn to read and spell. Well, that was exactly the correct recommendation. So when I test him in third grade, there's been absolutely no improvement in reading or spelling. And so, you know, I asked, I said, what happened to that first grade recommendation? And, you know, they said, well, nobody really understood what it meant. You know, they didn't know what it meant or, you know, how to do that. So, you know, for two years now, um, no improvement at all in reading or spelling. And he's, you know, also starting to be a bit of a behavior problem. So it's just because of the frustration. So, you know, this is just an example of um, sometimes where it just doesn't make sense to me what's happening, you know, with um, accommodations on high stakes tests. Here we've got Melanie. She's a medical student. She's in her third year of medical school. Um, throughout her educational history, she's been regarded as having an impairment. Uh, she has records clearly document her impairment. Over the years, she's had four neuropsych evaluations from highly qualified professionals that all recommend she gets extended time. High school, she had a 504 plan, provided extended time on exams. She was approved for the accommodation of extended time on all high stakes exams in the past, including SAT, ACT, uh, and MCAT. And so um, she also got extended time for three years in medical school. So now when she's just applying for accommodations on this exam, her request for extended time is denied. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't know, it's just these situations are kind of mind boggling because it's like, she's received this all the way through medical school. And then at the very end, you say she can't have, you know, accommodations. I, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me because, you know, extra time doesn't bring extra knowledge. It just allows individuals with disabilities a chance to really demonstrate, you know, what they know. So I just sort of wish we would give everybody extra time and say, here's the room if you want more time. Here's the room if you want the standard time. Um, so, you know, making requests for accommodations, make sure there's a clear rationale presented that documents the need for justification of the accommodation, um, that there's evidence for the need of accommodation in the educational history, teacher reports, detentions, tutoring, special ed services, uh, the request for accommodation is supported by the assessment results, you know, as well as the educational um, history. So I haven't seen uh, many cases of this uh, in terms of, in fact, this was one a colleague sent to me and she said, I want to know what you think, okay? Um, Sandy's 20 years old. She says she has dyslexia. She needs extra time to pass her college exams. And so, you know, here's her writing samples. Now, you know, we look at this, the boy is going to run. You can see she's got two spelled O-T. She's got the spelled H-T-E. Mm -hmm. You know, then we look down the lamp and sun. Sun is spelled S-N-U. Um, look at fresh air, F-R-E-H-S-I-A-R. -E hmm. um, you know, so you, it's just strange, collar, C-O-L-L-R-A. You know, so it's like, hmm, this is very suspicious, very suspicious, sold, S-L-O-D. So then you're looking at, um, you know, again, more writing, and you see again, she's just, you know, yours, Y-O-R-U-S. But then, you know, take a look at her spelling. Take a look at her spelling. Okay, congenial, coax, carriage, syllable, need, arrogance, disappearance, apostrophe. And she can't spell the and two, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, what had happened was she had heard that people with dyslexia reverse letters, you know, when they're writing. Um, she didn't know that meant when they're spelling too. Um, but so here she does a, you know, great job. Anyway, you know, it turns out um, she just had high anxiety and was trying to think of a way, you know, to get, you know, more time. 
here's my emotional support dog after I tell him all my problems. <laughs> oh my. Um, you know, so another challenge has been um, use of multiple tests. And so in order to do a comprehensive dyslexia evaluation, we often find ourselves going to three or four different tests to use different facets of different tests. They have uh, different norm samples, different age and grade ranges, uh, even having access to various tests. So some people don't have access to um, certain tests that would be helpful. Um, and they all have different types, you know, of test scores. So, you know, one of the things we decided to do really about six years ago, I think it's been that long now, but, you know, we thought, why don't we put everything that we need for comprehensive assessment of dyslexia uh, in one battery, one battery. And so, you know, that, that was our goal was to create a test where most of what you'd need in a dyslexia evaluation, um, you know, would be there um, in the test. Uh, so the Todd has a screener, um, and then there's the Todd early for kindergarten to second grade, uh, the Todd comprehensive, you know, first grade uh, through adult. So the uh, Todd early um, has these nine tests, okay? The screener has a dyslexia risk index, that just kind of gives you an idea of you might want to dig a little bit deeper with this child. Um, so there's an early dyslexia diagnostic index, you know, based on those bolded tests. And it just suggests the probability uh, that this is looking, you know, like um, it's dyslexia. So the Todd Early Index, okay? So the Early Diagnostic Index contains both um, linguistic processing risk factors as well as early reading and spelling skills. And so those two um, indexes are combined to make the Early uh, Dyslexia Diagnostic uh, Index. So the composites on the Todd E are early sight word acquisition, early phonics knowledge, early basic reading skills, um, early phonological um, awareness. Now the Todd comprehensive is much more comprehensive. Uh, there's 23 tests on there. Uh, you rarely would probably give all 23. So you would uh, choose which test to administer you know, based on the age of the person, based on the referral question, based on what you already know. But um, there's also a dyslexia diagnostic index composed of those um, eight tests. Um, and so that index is a combination of the linguistic processing index um, and the reading spelling index. And so um, it has both the uh, uh, predictors of reading failure um, and then also measures, you know, of actually reading and spelling skill. So um, these are the composites that we have on the Todd. Um, so there's several reading and spelling um, composites, uh, linguistic processing composites. So these would be our risk factors for reading failure, uh, phonological awareness, rapid naming, auditory working memory, orthographic processing, uh, visual verbal paired associate learning. Uh, and then we also have measures of vocabulary uh, and reasoning, you know, to help in determining cases where uh, it really is unexpected, the reading difficulty, or that um, oral language and reasoning skills are much higher um, than reading performance. So um, we also created an uh, intervention and recommendation book um, so that when you find there's a problem in one of these areas, there are examples of recommendations that you could, you know, copy or use uh, in terms of, you know, addressing uh, the issues. So the Todd also has three rating scales, a self-rating scale, parent and teacher uh, rating scale. Um, we tried to do the self-rating uh, scale with the younger kids, but it just didn't work out very well. They don't um, really have a very clear understanding yet of what's difficult. Um, but so 
um, we've got parent and teacher rating scales, uh, just to add in that very important qualitative um, information to help you see the the teacher and parents, you know, both um, kind of add support in terms of, you know, is this um, dyslexia? So we're excited about the TOD. It'll be out next year. And on February 27th, we are going to uh, do a webinar just introducing you a little more depth, you know, about what is in uh, the TOD. So every once in a while, yeah, you got, you know, you wonder about the qualifications, knowledge of an examiner. <laughs> Long time ago, we were in this school, but there was a person who did testing that kids just didn't like him. And so we'd always think, oh, so-and-so did the test. We got to add on 15 points, you know, just because his scores would always be so low because kids were kind of scared of him. But, you know, you look at, this was on the NAS list, sir. Um, have you ever had a student with average cognitive ability and low reading? Uh, eight years old, grade two, on the DOS two. Uh, you can see those nice high scores. And, you know, then you look um, in contrast at the reading scores on the KTEA three, uh, quite a difference there. And the person says, I'm at a loss. Any advice on what's going on? what I should be recommending or additional testing I should do? Would you qualify this student? We use the discrepancy model, so she technically qualifies, but I have no idea what I'd be recommending. Attendance is great. She's been in lab reading services since kindergarten. She also receives small group instruction in the general uh, education classroom. <laughs> you know, I mean, and so you just go, this is so clearly, you know, um, you know, a case of dyslexia, but, uh, you know, it's just like, oh, oh my. Um, but, uh, you know, we all do start somewhere, and I'll, I'll just tell you a little kind of funny anecdote. Um, so, you know, I, 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 a special ed teacher, it's my first year, okay, I got a master's in behavior disorders. I don't think I had a clue what I was doing. But um, anyway, um, so first week of school and um, the school psychologist comes up to me and says, Nancy, I want you to give John a rat tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm thinking a rat. I'm thinking there's a hamster in the fifth grade class or maybe that. But I think, why does she want me to give John a rat? You know, so I was, oh, sure. Don't, don't you worry. I'm, I'm just the person to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a rat tomorrow. Uh, John a rat. Anyway, you know, that was a wide range achievement test. I had no idea what she was talking about, you know, but um, so point being again, you know, when we all start out, we're just, you know, a little bit of a fraud for a while. But the good news is if you really like the kids, you know, they make a lot of progress. So, <laughs> oh boy. So anyway, um, you know, I have retired from the university. And so I've got to say it's a little bit of a fake retirement because I seem to still be doing things. But um, one of the tough things about when you retire, particularly when you've been in an office for 30 years, is you have to clean it out. And, you know, you, there's this part of you that just wants to empty all of it, that just throw everything in the garbage and walk out, you know. But that you just feel like you have to look at things. And, you know, I was glad I did because I came across some things. I don't even know where I got them, but I thought, golly, that's kind of funny. So this was one of them. <clears throat> Dear Ashley, would you please be my girlfriend? I like you a lot. Yes, no, maybe. P.S. Please put yes, no, or maybe. I'm sorry, I already have a boyfriend, Kyle. But when we break up, you're my next choice. P.S. That'll probably be in a month or two. <laughs> oh, anyway, I thought that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, um, you know, we do know, again, how important well-trained teachers are. And so we want to make sure evaluations, uh, you know, lead to um, intervention. One of the most important conclusions from research is for children with learning problems, learning's hard work. A corollary to this finding is that for teachers, instruction is very hard work. Um, and it requires an enormous amount of training um, and support. And so um, in our first 
couple of webinars. We saw Aiden starting when he was in second grade, then fourth grade, and now he made this video uh, for his fifth grade teacher. So he says, one of my weaknesses is spelling because it's hard to hear the sounds and write. Another weakness is reading because the words move on the page. If I made the rules, every word would look like it sounds. I think we've all wished that at times. But then he says, a strength I have is math. I'm good at problem solving. Another strength is my creativity. I can make anything I can think of. I am a Lego master. I'm also very hard working. And so another thing again, we just want to make sure of is um, our kids know their strengths. And so um, that that's part of the challenge too, is making sure you determine you know, strengths. So um, Joey's in third grade and you kind of look at his writing here. Uh, long ago, people lived in homes, people hunted for food, you know, and he has sad faces on his paper there, you know, um, Joey was starting to get stomach aches and not want to go to school. Um, and so he did then uh, get referred, got evaluated, uh, started receiving, you know, special um, education services. And so I saw him about six months later, I looked in his folder, you know, and I saw this picture and I thought, you know, it's great. He feels like a champion again because he's, you know, getting the kind of help uh, that he needs. So by fifth grade, 
you know, he was actually uh, doing very, very well. So he says, if aliens are real, I'd like to know. Jimmy Carter said he saw a UFO. I don't think a president would lie except Richard Nixon. <laughs> so I'd like to know if aliens are real. <laughs> but um, anyway, you know, he was, um, you know, really uh, doing quite well then. You know, it's sort of like, well, you know, why not? Why not? So if we teach these kids to read, you know, it opens up the world. Um, they can kind of really do, you know, anything uh, that they want. So Dr. Martha Dankler said, you know, what these kids need more than anything um, is a guardian angel. And so they really need somebody to advocate for them, support them. Hopefully they have several people. Uh, it can be a parent, it can be a teacher, you know, and ideally it's teachers, um, you know, and parents, you know, advocating uh, for these kids. So I will, um, you know, congratulations, Mrs. Roberts, you have changed my life. Um, you know, it makes such a difference. So um, several years ago, I was up in Utah and it was a decoding dyslexia conference and everybody had these badges on that said PhD. I thought that's pretty cute. Um, you know, person, you know, helping dyslexia, person helping dyslexia. And so, um, you know, I really thank you uh, for all that you do in terms of providing support, um, interventions for our students uh, with dyslexia. And uh, I do look forward to talking with you um, again in February. Um, and I know now Stephanie's going to share a little bit about some housekeeping kinds of things. Um, and then we'll come back again and uh, take some time for some questions. So I hope no one gets off at this point because we have uh, a question and answer session uh, that will uh, be the time where some of the questions that you've submitted ahead of time or some of the questions that you submitted during this, uh, this webinar will be answered by Dr. Mather. So just give us a minute and we'll get right to that question and answer. If you could advance the slide, Nancy, uh, Dr. Mather, that would be great. All right. So the tests of dyslexia, there have been a lot of questions about tests of dyslexia in the chat, in the uh, Q&A. And I just want to say uh, we have put a link and if one of our uh, people on these, this current um, uh, webinar, one of our panelists, if you could please post again the link to the, yes, uh, Laura just posted it, the link to the, um, it's Todd mailing list. On that Todd mailing list page, there is a video that will explain who can give the, who can give the tests of dyslexia, uh, how they can work together to give it, uh, the parts, the components of the tests of dyslexia, all the tests, everything is there in that link. So if you could go ahead and go there, that would be great. Uh, also, uh, join that mailing list because you'll get updates on, on when the test is coming out and when it's available for pre-sale as well. You can go ahead and advance the slide. In addition, if you have questions about any of our assessments or need more information from one of our assessment consultants, uh, please feel free to send an email to consult at wpspublish.com. And then uh, uh, those were the assessment consultants, the, Ann Rogers and I, the, yes, we have Ashley Arnold, Doug Lean, Jackson, Laura Stevenson, um, Donna Berghauser and Amanda Wynn. We also have Stephanie Needler who will uh, be an assessment consultant uh, available to you beginning in January. Also, Ann Rogers and I are business development managers for WPS. My work focuses more with general education teachers, counselors, reading specialists, uh, educational diagnostician, and special education teachers. So I'm happy to help you. Uh, and Ann Rogers focuses on large healthcare and other non school types of uh, uh, organizations. So this is just our, our map. Um, we will be um, making some changes to that in the near future. And then uh, also, like I said, uh, we have a ton of resources. We have our WPS online evaluation system. I know some people have asked if this will be on other publishers' uh, online systems. It will not be. It will be on the WPS online evaluation system. So again, for more information on anything about the tests of dyslexia, send an email to consult at wpspublish.com. Uh, please visit our YouTube channel as well as our video resources that are available on our WPS page. We have a telepractice page and a content hub as well. 
they are now linked in the chat box. You can forward that, advance that, okay. And one more time, and uh, this is just a, if you wanna generic contact us by email, you can go to our website as well. But again, uh, please email consult at wpspublish.com for assistance. All right, now we're going to get into our question and answer. Uh, I'm excited about this part because a lot of people have questions and uh, people, a lot of people have questions about a Spanish version. So I just wanna say up front, we will be, um, we will not have a Spanish version available uh, right now. We will be working with our international partners. So there may be a Spanish version down the line. So if you can um, just, uh, again, send that email to consult at wpspublish.com. All right, let's get into some questions. Dr. Mather, are you ready? So let's talk about who is qualified to give the assessment. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know that uh, we have portions of the test that teachers can give. I know we've talked about reading specialists, educational diagnosticians, special educators, but can you expand a little bit on that and how it would be used? You know, I, again, I think you've pretty much covered it, but um, I, I think our vision is that this will really be like a team approach where, um, you know, people can kind of share information in some situations. It might be a reading teacher that administers a test. Other situations, there might be a school psychologist, might be a speech language pathologist. Um, there may be pieces that certain, you know, people administer. So we're really hoping to see this as a tool that integrates all disciplines, you know, kind of can share, you know, information. Yeah, I know it, it's really, um, as someone who's worked in the schools, it's really hard uh, when you have uh, teams that are disjointed and aren't coming together. So it, I love that approach. I'm so glad we're taking that approach with, with this. I know that there's been some discussion about whether dyslexia is a medical diagnosis because people say, well, if it's a disorder that's neurobiological, in nature, then then how do you have a non-medical person di diagnosing or identifying whether you're in schools or you're in private practice? And, you know, uh, how, how do you talk about that? I think there's a dear colleague letter you talked about in a previous session. Do you want to expand on that? Well, I mean, the government um, sent out a dear colleague letter 2015, where they essentially said giving schools permission to use the terms dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and IEP 504s. Um, evaluations and really encouraging uh, local districts and schools to use these, you know, terms, um, you know, when they're appropriate. Uh, and so, you know, that was an important letter, you know, we talked about, but, um, you know, there's really been a resurgence um, in use of the term dyslexia. And I also think it partially because we have such a good understanding, you know, of what it is, how it manifests itself, um, and so, you know, it's helpful when you have a problem to understand what the problem is. Um, so when you're tying, when, when in the first part of the question, because I know I went on for a while. So in the first part of the question where someone asks about, well, if it's a neurobiological condition, how can somebody other than a medical doctor uh, identify or, di or diagnose this? What, what would you say about that? Well, you know, again, um, you know, it's kind of like ADHD too. I mean, they're neurobiological, but a lot of the diagnosis is made really just um, by looking at their reading, by looking at their spelling, um, things that educators, you know, do. Um, and so, you know, you know, lots of, usually the people in the school um, have the best understanding, you know, of what it is, um, you know, what's going on. Okay. All right. So uh, another question that comes up often is, I know you talked about intelligence and um, that I know in the previous webinar, and I think you touched on it today, you talked about intelligence, not having to have a certain level of intelligence to have a dyslexia diagnosis or to be identified with dyslexia. Can you expand on that a little bit and, um, you know, the cognitive portion of that? You know, we can kind of come back to it, the fact that it's a neurobiological <laughs> disorder, you know, and so um, when you think about that, there's no way it would differentiate and say, I'm only going to affect people with high intelligence. And, you know, so it could, anywhere along the bell-shaped curve, 
Um, you, you can have dyslexia. You can have someone with an intellectual impairment who also has dyslexia. Now, might not be the most pressing issue. You know, um, you can have a student, you know, who is deaf and has dyslexia or blind and has dyslexia. Um, but it might not be the most pressing issue. But anybody can have dyslexia, really, you know, of any level um, of intelligence. And so, you know, it gets problematic places where they say you have to have normal intelligence to qualify for dyslexia because then there's sort of a whole part of the bell shaped curve that's not eligible uh, for services for dyslexia. Yeah. It's, it becomes very tough when you have those kind of um, constraints when, when you're the people that are looking to see what kids need. So, uh, you know, there are some questions that have popped up about, um, you know, the developmental progression uh, when it comes to younger individuals, when they're writing and they have, uh, they write letters backwards and, and people say, you know, it's developmental until they're eight. Um, at what age should you be concerned or what are some other signs if that's happening and they're five, six years old, you know, at what age should they be assessed and how do you know if it's developmental or not developmental? Well, we don't sometimes is the truth. Um, but, um, you know, the thing is, uh, you have to look at all pieces. Now, typically people say once you've been exposed to the alphabet for a year, pretty systematically in most children, reversal stops. Um, so a year of instruction. So it depends how much instruction was given in kindergarten, where it's unlikely in first grade that they would still be, you know, reversing letters. But, you know, we think of a student like Kai, he was making half of his letters backwards. That's very, that's unusual, you know, even um, for a tip. I and mean, that's just, you know, unusual. And then you also have to pull in information um, from like family history. Is there a family history of this? Um, were there early speech and language problems? And so you got to look at the complete, you know, picture. Um, but, you know, just as kids, when they're just starting to learn to write, it's normal, you know, to, to do things this way, that way, because we it's kind of arbitrary. You just have to learn it. But, you know, typically developing kids, once they've seen it enough times, you know, they know it and they know the spatial orientation of the letter. You'll see sometimes high school kids, still making BD reversals, you know, yeah. in high school. Yeah. Know? So, yeah. Um, so you brought up something that's important and you talked about a uh, history of speech and language difficulties. Can you talk about uh, uh, the, the uh, significance of having a speech language uh, disorder early on and then later uh, its relationship to dyslexia and possibly also, which is a little bit in addition, I'm trying to get a couple questions in here. Um, also the comorbidity of uh, expressive receptive language disorders with dyslexia. So I know there are two, it's a two part question, but. Um, well, you know, as we talked about, there's just high comorbidity, you know, between speech and language disorders um, and dyslexia, you know, particularly when there's um, problems in phonology early on, like a lot of articulation errors and things like that. So it starts out in speech and then pretty soon before it's in print, you know, too. Um, and so you really have to watch those kids who have a lot of, you know, difficulty, um, you know, with articulation. So um you know again there's this overlap but you know lots of times with children in preschool we can just kind of see other concerns or not um able to rhyme words or you know not interested in looking at print there you know um, there's a family history of things and so there's sometimes early red flags where it's just we got to keep our eyes on this child you know mm -hmm. um, but the yeah. important thing is getting the early, you know, intervention. That's what's important. Yeah. So uh, as far as the, uh, I like going back to the, uh, definitely early intervention is important. I want to also touch on the comorbidity piece that you talked about. And so um, it's, it's really hard as a professional uh, working with a uh, child when they have so many different things going on. That's the part of the reason for this, uh, webinar today, the challenges. And so, you know, I think that um, someone asked about, you know, the, the, with the comorbidity with the expressive and receptive language disorder, you know, does that, do you feel that makes it a lot more difficulty, difficult to pull, pull things apart 
when you're evaluating if they have the expressive language disorder or receptive expressive language disorder, since a lot of times, you know, if the comp comprehension, if they have dyslexia and comprehension issues, a lot of times that that's coming from an expressive language disorder, or what do you think? Well, uh, yeah, and it gets complicated a little bit too, in terms of if you're in a school district, you know, what model is being used for SLD identification, you know? Mm -hmm. So if it's an ability achievement discrepancy um, and you've got low oral language, you're likely to have a lower score on, you know, the ability measure. And so you're not gonna have a discrepancy. So you do though have, you know, dyslexia and a language disorder. And so, you know, in that case, it's much easier looking at a pattern of strengths and weaknesses where you see low reading, low language, but, you know, high reasoning, high math, you know, and so a much easier. Um, so that, that's just a real problem when you've got ability achievement discrepancy. Right, right. Uh, let's move on to some other, a different type of question. So I, I know um, you've spoken about this before, but uh, do you, uh, will the Todd address different subtypes of dyslexia? Or where's the, where's the um, literature on that at this point? Well, you know, you look back historically and people have talked about subtypes, you know, since back in the 30s, 40s, you know, um, so we've, you know, had all kind of different, you know, subtypes, auditory dyslexia, visual dyslexia, surface dyslexia, um, you know, so we've had lots of different names for different subtypes of uh, dyslexia. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is identify the underlying linguistic risk factors, which could differ. It might be phonological awareness. It might be rapid naming. Um, you know, it might be working memory. Um, and so we're trying to identify the underlying linguistic risk disorder, which then would kind of tell you what kind of problem it's going to be. So. If a student has slow, rapid, automatized naming, you're likely to see the problems in reading rate. Uh, if it's poor phonological awareness, you're likely to see the problem is in you know, phonics. And so um, getting kind of consistency between just linguistic risk factor um, and its impact on reading and spelling you know, development. So you know, that's kind of the goal. So that's why you have the indexes, uh, the reading and spelling index and that linguistic processing index. So you're not necessarily... Uh, trying to identify types, you're trying to figure out where the breakdown is so that the instruction can be designed around that breakdown. Is that accurate? No, I mean, so, you know, there'd be the phonological processing type, the orthographic processing type, the working memory, you know, type. I mean, in terms of these linguistic kind of process things, but, um, you know, we're not necessarily, um, you know, calling them, you know, um, a certain name. <laughs> right, right. I, I know that there's been um, different different opinions about whether there are these types or what what are the types and that kind of thing over the years. So, okay. Uh, as far as let me see, let's see. We have another question here. Um, okay, tell tell us about. Oh, someone asked if the Todd was available in Spanish. I just want to very quickly say it is not currently going to be available in Spanish, but we are working with our international partners and they will possibly be uh, bringing out uh, the tests of dyslexia in Spanish. We'll, we'll have to wait and see about that. So just wanted to clarify that. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, hmm. All right. Can you uh, diagnose dyslexia or identify dyslexia, depending on your setting? Um, can you uh, do that without giving a full IQ test? Um, yes, you know, so absolutely um, you can. There's a lot of controversy um, in the field right now, kind of two camps, one saying IQ tests are you know, totally unnecessary. Another camp saying they give you, you know, helpful information. I think what, what we have to think more of, um, not so much IQ tests, but cognitive ability tests. I mean, so it's important to know about the child's level of vocabulary. It's important to know about their processing speed. It's important to know about their working memory. It's important. And so some of the factors that are measured on intelligence tests uh, can give us insight into the students, you know, reading and spelling difficulties. Um, and so I think 
the concept of having it to have it to be a full scale IQ um, when there'd be situations where that might be very good information, particularly with twice exceptional kids. But um, yeah, and so what's probably most important is not an IQ test, but looking at the underlying linguistic risk factors that can co contribute to reading failure. But then also there would be situations where you wanna identify strengths. So maybe you wanna identify strengths in reasoning and vocabulary and you know other, other areas. So it's really kind of on a case by case, you know, basis. Um, okay. So the bottom line is, you know, like you said, case by case basis, each professional, each team has to decide whether that is a useful piece of information uh, and follow their uh, local procedures, etc. cetera. Um, but to be clear, because someone was asking this, this is not an IQ test. Um, and so people who work in states where they are assessing certain individuals that they're not allowed to give IQ tests with, this is not an IQ test. So this is a test that could be utilized in those circumstances. Okay, let's see. Um, so a lot of people asked about, that leads me into the next question where a lot of people are asking about a lot of different assessments. Obviously it's up to the professional to give whatever assessment they feel is, is appropriate, but uh, you all designed this as a very comprehensive test so that um, you wouldn't need other assessments um, uh, if you're giving this for dyslexia. Is that is that appropriate to say or? You know, I mean, we attempted to make this comprehensive and you probably wouldn't need um, other assessments in terms of diagnosing dyslexia. But in terms of a comprehensive evaluation, you know, there may be times where you want to demonstrate that the student is doing quite well in mathematics. Um, just to show again, sort of the unexpectedness of this reading difficulty. I mean, um, and also making the point too that they don't need any intervention in math, you know? so. Um, it just depends, again, how broad and comprehensive, but if dyslexia is your focus and not beyond, uh, in most cases, you would have, you know, all the different, you know, measures uh, that you would need. Again, you know, there's 23 different tests, you know, on the comprehensive battery, so it's quite a collection of tests. Yes, and there are 30 tests total. Is that accurate? Yes, I think it is. And you have the, the rating scales, the intervention piece, and someone else asked uh, about the, um, the reports online. So we are offering free scoring online on the Todd and so, uh, and reporting, free scoring and reporting. So you would um, then be able to do an intervention plan based on the data and it would, it would then uh, give you um, recommendations based on the data that comes from the test. I just want to clarify that because somebody did ask. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to try and pick one more question uh, and then um, uh, get get moving forward and wrap up. So uh, does, what are the, okay, does dyslexia always have to involve a phonemic component or could students have their sounds intact and still potentially have it? Yeah, and, and so again, we talked a you know, little bit about um, that phonological awareness is one linguistic risk factor, but um, as Dr. Bruce Pennington said, you know, if that's we, what we just limit ourselves to, we're going to miss about you know, half of the cases. And so there are students who have very strong phonological processing uh, and they have dyslexia. And sometimes it's sort of that um, letter binding of making associations between the phonemes and the graphemes and then retaining those connections. You know, sometimes that's where the problem is. Sometimes the problem is more um, the visualization of words. And so it's more with an orthographic processing thing where they're having trouble getting a picture of words. And so they, you know, have to see a word hundreds of times before they know mm -hmm. it as a sight word, you know? And so there's lots of things going on besides um, just phonological awareness. Phonological uh, awareness is critical, but it's not necessary for a di dyslexia diagnosis. And it, I think that's one of our biggest problems is if we limit ourselves to single deficit models like this, you know, we're going to miss a lot of the cases of uh, individuals that really do have dyslexia and it's not phonological. And the other thing to think about too is the intervention is different. There's a, a 
different interventions when it's a phonological awareness problem, you know, versus it's more of an orthographic processing problem or it's a rate uh, problem, you know, the, the interventions are completely different. So it's really important we understand why, you know, a student is struggling. And one reason would be poor phonological awareness, but it's just one reason. Mm, gotcha. So I know I said that was the last one, but I have a couple more thoughts because it just sparked some other other things. Uh, and, and you had talked about RTI and uh, schools. And I was recently at a um, professional development opportunity where uh, the person was talking to a lot of um, general educators uh, and, and they talk about diagnostic tests. And I think sometimes when people talk about diagnostic tests, they think diagnosis or you're looking for disability, but sometimes diagnostic tests can mean you're just trying to diagnose the problem with reading or whatever it is. So could you see this test also be using, being used in, in RTI or multi-tiered multi systems of support and not just for diagnosing or identifying a disability? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, absolutely. Because even if you're operating in an RTI um, framework, and the child's not learning to read, you really need to understand why they're not learning to read. And you need to understand where did they need help? What can they do? Where are they struggling? And so you really have to use diagnostic tools then, you know, to dig a little bit deeper. You know, they're not making progress in the RTI, but then the question is, why aren't they making progress? And that's what you have to find out. And that's how these tools you know, can really help you delve in and figure out this is what's going on. This is why. Right. And it's not too late in middle school or high school to, to evaluate a student uh, with this tool, uh, correct? To, to look for dyslexia? No, no, you know, absolutely it's not too late. And, you know, um, the earlier the better, but uh, later is better than never. Um, you know, I, I can think of some situations when, you know, Adults get diagnosed the first time because their child comes to school and gets a diagnosis, and then they realize they have it too. You right. Know? But then it's such a relief for them to understand it wasn't because I wasn't smart, you know. It, it, and so then they start. And so um, the earlier we can help people develop an understanding of dyslexia, what it is, how we treat it, um, you know. And so, again, that they don't become adults with self-esteem issues because they didn't understand why learning was challenging and reading was challenging. So we, so take, this is, yeah. we take the mystery out of it, you know, yeah. and so and that, that's important is, you know. Yeah. So this is why you started the assessment at age five and you go through age 89, which I love that, you know, yeah. for uh, people who are adults who are, are seeking help, can they can utilize this assessment. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Mather, for presenting today. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And as a person who is, was a professional working in schools and also a family member of someone with dyslexia, this, in, this is such important information that we have to get out to professionals, educators, uh, and uh, parents as well. So thank you so much for coming today well, and, and presenting. You. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate uh, being here. And thank you very much for your great questions. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. We hope that um, you have a great rest of the day. And please check out all of our resources on our website. You will be getting follow-up emails with the resources. And we also have a, a Tests of Dyslexia a page where you can sign up for updates and look for the next webinar on February 27th. Uh, and you will be getting notification about that as well. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Visit WPS today to start unlocking potential.